The great need of the hour is for faithful men to be raised up, to be able to go and to lead God's people uh, as those who are a light in this dark world. Send thou, O Lord, to every place, swift messengers before thy face, the heralds of thy wondrous grace, send them where thou wilt come. Welcome to the G3 Podcast. I'm Virgil Walker. I'm here with Josh Bice and Scott Annual. Excited for this particular edition of the podcast, man. This was a podcast that God knew was going to happen. A he long, didn't just know it. He didn't just know it. He ordained it. He ordained <laughs> this podcast yes. to have to take place exactly. Oh, so cheesy, what, so uh, cheesy. <laughs> but um, bum You didn't like that one? It's a great dad joke, Virgil. Okay, yeah. well, I chalk one up for the dad joke. I'll take it. <laughs> I'm all about dad jokes. Yeah, I am too. I, whenever I can get it, man. Listen, this is going to be a great uh, su a subject topic. I think the reason why is because this is a doctrine, unfortunately, that uh, gets gets fought about, gets fought gets fought over uh, at times in uh, in churches. I remember the church I came from. The, the doctrine of predestination uh, was one that people had some problems. It seems to me, Josh, and, and I'm, I'll I'll toss this to you, that everyone loves God's sovereignty in every other area except for uh, the issue of salvation in particular. And so that's where arguments begin to arise in what God preordained before the foundation of the world. And so uh, we're going to be talking about the subject of predestination, uh, the, the, the doctrine of predestination, and really want to cover it from a biblical point of view. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think you're right on. I think it's a, it's a shame when we think about the fact that something like a, a precious doctrine that's recorded for us in the Bible would be something that would be used for a means of division within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we know that there are various different uh, interpretations of what the word predestination means or to be predestined by God. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what we don't do in, in the study of the Bible is we don't go to search out on a blog site to find out what someone's opinion is of the Word and then adopt that to just be what we believe the Bible is actually teaching. Right. That's not the way in which we study the Bible. We study the Bible by actually studying words. We have to think about the morphology, the etymology of words. We have to think about you know, how was this word used in extra biblical literature around the time in which this specific letter was written? We have to then take into consideration the context by which we find the word. Because when you study the Bible, you'll have a word that could be uh, interpreted or it could mean 
uh, one specific thing in this passage, but in another passage, it could mean something else. Mm -hmm. You take a root word and then you add a prefix onto the front side of it. That could change the meaning of the word in and of itself. And so we have to be honest about how we study the Bible. And so what you don't do is just quickly run to Google and find out what someone's opinion is and then say, well, then because this guy who's influential, he says it means this, well, then that's what I believe it means too. Right. That's not the way in which we study the Bible. Right. So we actually have to dig and scratch into the text and then bring to the surface the actual meaning of the word. Yeah. And so when it comes to predestination, you go back and you look at how the word was used outside of the Bible. Okay, this is how the word was used. And then you go over to the Apostle Paul. So, so like when he uses the word in, in Romans 8, mm-hmm. and he talks about you know being predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Well, the word there used that, that we know is predestination is pro horizo. You take that in terms of extra biblical literature and you see sailors going out to like a wooden desk and they're in a port city and before they get on the ship that they're going to sail across this vast body of water, they would roll out in primitive context this old map and they would look at, okay, here's where we are and then here's the port that we're going to go to. Here's where we're going to sail to. And even with the use of like a telescope, they couldn't see across this body of water. So all they could see is the horizon where it meets the water. So all you could see is water. Mm -hmm. And so before they leave this destination or this port, uh, they're, they're, they're making a, a predetermined decision that they're going to actually not just land on any port on this coastline, mm-hmm. but this specific port. And they have to navigate tides, wind, storms, seasonal issues. And, and so that they would take all of that into consideration and calculate uh, when they would need to leave in order to make it there at a specific time, at a specific destination. Mm-hmm. That's the way in which the word pro horizo uh, was actually used. Pro meaning before, and then again, horizo to determine. We actually derive the English word horizon mm-hmm. from this from this specific word. Yeah. And so when the Apostle Paul uses the word in Romans, he's not talking about ships going from this port to this port. He's actually talking about human beings, yeah. and he's not talking about geographic destinations. He's actually talking about eternal destinies, and so we need to be honest about the way in which the word is actually used. Yeah, you have it, Romans twenty-eight, twenty-nine, or Romans eight, rather twenty-nine. What what you uh, you you uh, you quoted there for those he, he, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed. And to the image of his son, you have verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called those whom he called. He also justified those whom he justified. He glorified. We, we have we have language there. You have language in Ephesians uh, chapter one, uh, verse five. He predestined us for adoption to himself as as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will all of the, the the language there in scripture is absolutely clear here's here's a question that that I just want to offer up and and that is why do you believe people have such a problem mm-hmm. with what scripture obviously states yeah. uh, and what and what the word of god confirms which is god's sovereignty even in the area of salvation yeah yeah i think i think there's two things number 1 we we are born depraved, we're born selfish, we're born wanting to be king over our own lives. So we already are predisposed, (laughs) ironically, we're predisposed to not like predestination. We're predisposed not to like the idea that someone else has determined the course of history. Um, But second, it's, it's the, just the, the, um, the, the difficulty of the doctrine itself and reconciling it with our experience. Right. We feel free. We feel like we are in control. In control. So even if, it, it, even if it's not a sinful response to the doctrine, it's understandably challenging to intellectually reconcile in our minds. 
which is where we simply need to believe the word and recognize that we are fallible. God is God is sovereign. We we can't always understand how everything works together, and God is infinite and and you know far above us. And so we need to simply trust what the Bible says about about who God is. And the fact of the matter is, if God has not predestined all that will come to pass, then God ceases to be God. Mm-hmm. And so really the, the, the doctrine of God himself is at stake in, in this important truth. Yeah. I think about, as you were walking through that, I think about what the doctrine states, how the doctrine in Scripture comes before any kind of uh, person whose name is attached to the doctrine, right? So predestination is before Calvin, right? But I also thought about our, our dear friend David Miller mm-hmm. uh, and a story you told about uh, about how he got into, uh, I guess it was here, uh, where he talked about how Jesus was a Calvinist. <laughs> I, I think oftentimes people have a difficult time. They want to reject, quote unquote, Calvinism. Uh, and so they they thereby then reject doctrines that came way before Calvin. Uh, the doctrine of grace, the issue, you know, the doctrine of predestination as a result. Your yeah. thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, again, you think about the fact that uh, this doctrine in and of itself is a biblical doctrine. So number one, it's in the Bible. It's an actual word that's used in the Bible. So mm-hmm. we actually have to believe it. And then number two, it is connected uh, like a chain link to these other biblical doctrines. So it would not be uh, advisable when you're studying the Bible to take a specific doctrine that's in this chain link and then to isolate it and then to say, well, I'm going to just import my own understanding or meaning to this because if you do that, the whole chain breaks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand that, uh, again, back to the Romans 8 passage, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is you've got foreknowledge and then you've got predestination, and then you've got calling, and then you've got justification, and then you've got glorification. Mm-hmm. And all of this is what you know theologians will oftentimes refer to as the golden chain of salvation. Mm-hmm. And if that chain link is broken at any point, then it shatters altogether. Right. And so what does it mean that God foreknew us? Yeah. Well, obviously, any honest study of that word in and of itself, like we're talking about the study of this word, pro horizo is that you come to see that it's actually used in like the Septuagint talking about someone knowing or knew his wife. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you, you can see that you can see that, you know, uh, that, that, that it's, it's, it's referencing not just that God looks through a tunnel of time, Mm -hmm. but that he is choosing beforehand to, to love and so that's the idea. So this idea of, of knowing this intimate relationship, God in his foreknowledge is choosing to, before time, to demonstrate and to shower his love mm. on his elect people. Mm-hmm. And then you have the predetermination that they're actually going to be glorified. And then you have the aspect of you know calling and justification, which actually happens in our own personal life. Right. But... Glorification is 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 mentioned in the the past tense, although it hasn't happened yet. Right. right, right. And so, what's he saying? If God has determined to love you before time, if God has predetermined your destination in glory, guess what? There's no dropouts along the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and that biblical understanding of foreknowledge and then predestination of the whole thing reveals the beauty of this doctrine. Yeah. And that is what is so sad. You read any of these texts. The doctrine of predestination was was never meant to be a controversial, dry, stuffy sort of you know oppressive doctrine. For the believer, it is the doctrine that lets us know that God, not of anything in ourselves, set His love upon us. That ought to lead us to worship and love. That He determined what will happen in the course of our lives, which means that when we face suffering, we face difficulties. We know that God has a plan in that. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a doctrine that that's that's got practical import and devotional import. I mean, Calvin himself said, and yes, Calvin didn't come up with the doctrine, but he's often associated with it. And and you can tell people haven't read Calvin yeah. because when Calvin talks about predestination, it is a devotional doctrine that has practical import. Calvin said, this great subject is not, as many imagine, a mere thorny and noisy disputation, nor speculation which wearies the minds of men without any profit, but rather the doctrine of predestination is a solid discussion 
eminently adapted to the service of the godly because it builds us up in sound faith, trains us to humility, and lifts us up into an admiration of the unbounded goodness of God toward us while it elevates to praise this goodness in our highest dreams. Mm, I just think it's a beautiful expression of the the import of this doctrine. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I completely agree. I think about that with uh, with the passage in, in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Uh, I, I, I often, as I read and meditate on that particular verse, think about the fact that before before God even said, let there be light, uh, that, that he had a plan he foreknew us yes. uh, and he predestined us. And then once that, that, that was completed and finished and, and set, he then said, let there be light. Yeah. That, that, that's mind blowing. It is. And it should cause in us, create in us, uh, absolute worship of, of God. Yeah, it shouldn't cause controversy. The, the doctrine itself was never taught in the sense of like, let's put this word forth for consideration in like a seminary context mm-hmm. or for formal debate yeah. so that we can have yeah. a moderator yeah. and we can duke it out right. over this. It was actually found in the context of encouraging God's people to mm-hmm. understand as you go through trial and tribulation, as you endure hardship, as you journey on in the faith, here's what you need to know is that God's God's promise to you is that he will bring you all the way home. Right, man. Right. And, and that's really the the backdrop. And then interestingly enough, again, you, you mentioned David Miller and, you know, making that statement that Jesus was a Calvinist. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, the people that knew in the room and understood that, uh, again, they, they chuckled because sure. they understood what he was doing there. Sure. All he was saying was all you guys that are so, you know, bent on fighting over Calvinism, just know that Jesus taught those doctrines before they were given over to the the figure that we know in church history as John Calvin. Right. Jesus taught those doctrines. Right. But then you go to like Acts chapter two, Peter's preaching this flaming sermon at Pentecost. And what does he say? He looks into the faces of those people. Yeah. He points at them and he says that this Jesus that was delivered up by or to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. That language, when he's saying, you want to know who Jesus was? Jesus was, was delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. Absolutely. In other words, what he's saying there, that definite plan, that is the word horizo. Mm -hmm. Definite plan. This was God's determined plan before the foundation of the world is that the second person of the Godhead would actually take on human flesh yeah. and that he would be delivered over to to lawless, godless men and he would be crucified yeah. on behalf of his people. Yeah. Right. So I, I think on the one end, I think you guys n- nailed it when you said, you know, I think, Scott, you had said uh, one of the reasons for the rejection of this doctrine is our, you know, our, just our nature to want to be in, in complete control, our, our desire uh, to, to, to be able to say, hey, we've chosen. We're the ones who made <clears throat> the decision over and above that. I think on the other end of the spectrum, uh, you have those who study the doctrine, embrace the doctrine, and perhaps uh, have an air of of uh, you know arrogance about them. I know this, you don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know we call it cage stage Calvinism, mm-hmm. where where the th- there's almost an abuse of uh, of others who don't know what you know, as if you, yeah. you. I mean, it took you however long it did for you to come into a knowledge of the doctrines of grace, and now your expectation is that everyone should see what you see through that same lens. Yeah. And so I, I speak to that for us for a little yeah, bit. I think when, when you see that, it just reveals that the person doesn't really understand the doctrine of predestination, yeah. because if you understand the doctrine of predestination, it leads you to humility. That's yeah. right. Right. That God, God has ordained all things ultimately for his own glory and Romans eight for the good of his people. Right. That's the hope. And so any knowledge that I have, my own salvation is not based on my own, wisdom or intellect or higher status than someone else. Mm-hmm. It's based merely on the 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 for for love, for knowledge of God and his determined will. That ought to lead us to be a very humble people, not a haughty people. Uh, whatsoever. Mm. Absolutely. De- definitely for me, it's it's one of humility. Why why should God save me? Why What I actually deserve is hell. What yeah. I actually deserve is his wrath. What I actually deserve uh, is, is all the pain and suffering for the sins that I've committed against a holy 
God, and if I understand that, to be to to be one who's experienced God's foreknowledge uh, and and His redemptive plan through Christ yeah. should absolutely cause me to be humbled at all yeah. times. And, yes. and if God if God is not control of all things, then what hope do we have? Yeah. I mean, the cross is a perfect example, right? Mm-hmm. I, any believer would say, yes, God determined the cross to happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's think about what he had to determine to happen in order for that to happen. Exactly. That means he ordained the actions, which Acts 2 clearly says, of Herod and the Gentiles mm-hmm. to put him on the cross. God ordains even the actions of individuals. If he doesn't, then then he doesn't control anything, and 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 there's no comfort. There's no hope. If something bad happens to you, well, maybe God can intervene and, and somehow fix it. But I, I would rather believe the God of the Bible that ordained that to happen, Romans 8, for the good of my sanctification. Yeah. There is purpose in that, mm-hmm. which leads me to humility, leads me not to be bitter, but to trust God with confidence that anything that happens in my life, there is a purpose because he has preordained it. Yeah, yeah that's a different way to live life, is it not? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's definitely, for, for me, has been a reassuring way to, to lead life. Uh, uh, Josh, you had mentioned, you know, the, the kind of the, what's, what's known as the golden chain of, of salvation of redemption. If you understand that, man, there are times in your walk when you definitely don't feel like you're, you know, you're walking uprightly. You're thinking, man, am I even saved? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can reflect upon the fact that, man, if, if 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 God has redeemed you, has ransomed you, has caused you to 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 uh, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the proclamation of the gospel, uh, that He indeed will sustain you. Yeah. Uh, he indeed will redeem you. You will indeed be not only justified but ultimately glorified. Yeah. That should cause you peace. It should cause you peace. And interestingly enough, a lot of people, like in conservative evangelical circles, that claim to hold to what you would often hear referenced as once saved, always saved, right. that type of theological position. Um, I think if you understand that properly, uh, you have to embrace predestination or you then have to deny predestination and then you have to appeal to the work of man to get himself home. Right. And, 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 and we, as we read the Bible, we have to reject that. Mm-hmm. We have to see that you don't just, like the doctrine of perseverance is not me working my way to God. Right. It is it is the fruit of of genuine saving faith that reveals that I have indeed been predestined and I will one day be glorified. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the perseverance of the saints, that's very much connected to the doctrine of predestination. What you're not communicating there is that this guy is working himself to glory. Right. Uh, what you're seeing is that he is on a journey of faith. And if you flatten that out and you look at it from above, it looks like one continuous line from here to here. Mm. But when you flip that and you don't flatten it out, but you flip it up and you look at it this way, and you and you see the ups and downs, you see that this man is, is doing well here, and now he's struggling, and he's doing well here, and now he's going through a trial, and he's going... He's doing well here, having victory over sin, and now he's he's experiencing difficulty and in, in sin again. But but ultimately he's continuing in the faith, and then ultimately he he ends up in the very presence of God in glory. Yeah. That is not his work. Yeah. That is the grace of God upon his life, yeah. and God is making sure that he arrives all the way home. Yeah. So the doctrine of predestination should not be something that we fight over. It should not be the source of division, but instead it should lift the people to the heights of praise and the worship of God, understanding that, yes, if we are truly saved, then we are always saved. And the reason that we can embrace a doctrine like that or even make a statement like that is because of the doctrine of predestination. Yeah. Yeah. As, you, as you said that, I, I immediately thought about our, our, our Sunday night uh, conversations and studies uh, through, through uh, Hebrews 11. Uh, and that the, the you know the, what's known as the the chapter the, the hall of fame a hall of faith, um, the, the lives of the men there and and what they experienced I think the the the, uh, the the example that you gave of looking directly at their lives seeing the ups and downs and uh, seeing the you know the successes and and the failures all being used in an effort to conform them into the image of Christ and then ultimately laid flat, looked from above, recognizing that uh, that, it, that it is by faith uh, that they experienced everything that they experienced and it's, and it's to God's glory 
uh, that that actually transpired. I, I think this is just a, a absolutely wonderful doctrine yeah. uh, that we shouldn't be fighting over, that we should embrace, that we should think about and leverage and use as we meditate on God's word to to ultimately give Him the glory that's due His name. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Any last any last minute things that you guys want to add to, in, in ways of summary? The only thing that I would say would just be what we said earlier, and and that would be this: if if you're just coming to the doctrine of predestination, maybe you've been raised in a church context where maybe you have not been exposed to the preaching of predestination, I would just urge you to be very patient Mm. and very careful not to just be using it as a billy club to to beat people over the head. Again, it was never intended for that purpose. And then again, if you find yourself as a pastor who's, you know, shepherding souls and you have people out that you're preaching to and, and they're struggling with the doctrine, uh, I would just urge brothers to be very, very patient as a pastor to shepherd them through because we didn't just come to to see the doctrine of predestination, right. you know, just the snap of a finger. Don't think because you preach one sermon and you explain the word pro horizo that now everyone's just going to be like a master on the doctrine of predestination. <laughs> right, right. You need to be very patient with people and allow them to make progress in the faith and to understand what this doctrine actually is. Yeah, yeah. Love that. Hopefully you were edified by what you heard. Uh, if, if I would encourage you to re-listen. Listen to this again. Walk through it. There was a number of uh, verses of Scripture that were used. Go back and look at those. Meditate on what God's Word said. This is a beautiful doctrine that I think each and every one of us uh, sh- should should fully, not, not simply embrace, uh, but experience the joy, I think, intended by God uh, uh, in, in the writing of of, of the word uh, for us, uh, again, share, like, share, subscribe uh, uh, to this particular podcast. Share it with others. Uh, download our G three app. Uh, You can go to plus.g3men.org in an effort to download the app. There's a lot of great content on there that is available to you. We make it available to you. Uh, Definitely there's a free aspect to it, but man, we would love for you to partner with us in ministry uh, by subscribing. It's $5.99 a month. Uh, That subscription helps us in a massive, massive way, though it's very light on the pocketbook. There'll be a bunch of different uh, resources that, that are there that are available to you, writing that we've done, blog articles, video content. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that, that definitely outweigh anything that you would spend uh, in that space. Definitely utilize that. Go to plus.g3men.org. I also want to encourage you, uh, if you have not uh, uh, decided to join us for the conference uh, there in Oklahoma, you should. The Cessationist Conference is coming up October 3rd through the 5th. Go to g3men.org forward slash events uh, and get registered. You'll want to join us for that particular conference. Thanks so much for joining us on this edition of the G3 Podcast.